Hey, I'm Drew, aka The Skilled Sonographer, and I have been a sonographer for about eight years now. I went to a general sonography program, so how did I end up in vascular? During my first year, I was working in a general sonography department, and I was looking for some additional work, so I applied to what I thought was another general sonography position at a different facility. I got a call back and they said the general ultrasound position has been filled, but would you be interested in a vascular ultrasound position? I said, sure. So here we are, several years later, still working in vascular. Who would have thunk it? Prior to that, I knew very little about vascular. I had no interest in it. It wasn't even on my radar, but I was like, shoot, let me just get my registry and move on. But I never moved on. <laughs> so today I'm working the 7.30 to 4 p.m. shift. When I first get to work, I usually pull up my laptop, check the schedule, and see if there's a patient already there. I work at an outpatient facility, so usually the process is that a nurse will bring the patient back. They will do intake ask them questions, get their history, then I will perform the ultrasound and then they will see the nurse practitioner or a doctor. Today I'm working with a vascular surgeon, the doctor, so it's definitely going to be busy. At a vascular facility we see patients with both venous and arterial issues. They might, for example, with venous issues they might have swelling in their legs, edema, they might have pain during their, the day in their legs, varicose veins, venous ulcers with arterial issues. They might have vascular claudication or even rest pain. Vascular claudication clinically presents as pain after the person walks a certain distance. They'll start getting pain, fatigue in their legs and they'll have to rest then start back walking. A lot of our patients, they might be smokers, diabetics, and sometimes they simply lead unhealthy lives or they have unfortunate genetics. Another thing that I do in the morning, especially working the 7.30 shift before everyone else gets there, I stock the rooms, turn on the machines. So I make sure there's enough linen, enough cleaning products, enough gel, make sure. Mm. So I just noticed that there was not a soiled linen bag in there and I just hurt my hand. I banged it against the counter I guess. So yeah I, I know I'm gonna have to go find where all the soiled linen bags are and you can see me struggling to get the linen together and at this point my hair gets stuck in the velcro. Natural hair and velcro do not mix apparently. Stocking linen and the rooms is not a job that goes away after graduating from school. You still have to do this as a sonographer. It is still our responsibility to make sure that things can flow properly throughout the day. In a little while, I will be showing you our machines, our ultrasound machines, as well as our arterial machines. So you can kind of get an idea of the types of machines we have. I will say a few qualities that are good to have doing this type of work are attention to detail, good communication skills, and adaptability because things, especially in a doctor's office, are constantly changing. Schedules are constantly changing as you will see in this video. So I wrote down all the exams that we're going to be doing today. BPG stands for bypass graft. So we'll do lower extremity arterial exams. And we'll only look at the graft, the inflow and the outflow as well. And I'll, I'm going to show you later on what I mean by bypass graft if you're not familiar with that. Sometimes we will look at stents, which are meant to keep arteries wide open or patent. We, we do a lot of lower extremity PVR exams. We do some upper extremity ones as well. Pulse volume recordings that make sure that there's blood flow going down towards the feet or the hands. We have a vein mapping on the schedule, carotid exams, and a mesenteric exam. 
I'm putting my food away in the fridge. And then I'm going to eat a little bit of breakfast while I look over the schedule and make sure that there are no more ultrasounds that I need to add on. So sometimes we have to kind of think like a physician. What ultrasound exams will the patient possibly need? So we have to anticipate the needs of the surgeon or the nurse practitioner. And sometimes we will go ahead and take the liberty of ordering an exam, but we'll double check with the physician once we have the time to do so. So we already have an add-on first thing in the morning. So now I'm going to be doing a right lower extremity reflux exam. So this patient likely has some swelling or something going on, um, some varicose veins. Those are the types of reasons we do the, those exams. And also again, cleaning up is a big part of our job, as you can see. And I'm gonna go over the reflux exam later on, a sample reflux exam. So once I perform an exam, I usually discuss the results with a physician. A lot of times I will just write it down on a sheet of paper and they, they'll read it themselves. But if something special is going on, something unique is going on, I'll actually talk to them. And one thing I've noticed about working with physicians, especially nurse practitioners too, they want direct answers. Sometimes if you start rambling, going on and on and on about, well, this is happening and this and that and this and that, their eyes seem like they glaze over. So I try to be as direct and simple in my terminology as possible so because a lot of them seem to just want you to get to the point that's my interpretation of body language that i have been reading so that's what i try to do and i think they typically appreciate that because with vascular surgery it's a lot of times it's really simple it's really simple either someone has a stenosis or they don't either they have a blood clot or they don't some issues are a little bit more complex so here's our arterial machine that I was talking about. So there's the lower extremity PVR exam that we do a lot. There are different types of um, exams that you can perform on this. There's the upper extremity PVR exam as well. So these machines are pretty easy to operate once you get used to it. And as you can see at the top of the machine, it explains exactly what you need to be obtaining at that time. You have to, yes, use a lot of cords to hook up to the blood pressure cuffs that you place on the patient, but it is cord color coordinated and they have labels, so it makes it a little bit easier. Yes, you can still mi get mixed up, but I'm gonna show you on the screen an example of a completed PVR. Now, here's our Philips epic five machine and i'm showing you the presets that we have it's different than in general ultrasound you see you don't have like ob you don't have gyn type presets here everything is pretty much vascular carotids arterial lower extremities and my protocols i love my protocols i only have them on a few exams but here's for example the carotid exam I have filled this out by hand on multiple of our machines. This is the reflux worksheet that I was mentioning. I filled this out on my own. This is just made up. This is not real patient stuff. So we look at the anterior accessory vein, great saphenous vein, the short saphenous vein, and the deep veins. We are looking to see if the valves in the veins work properly. If the blood is going back to the heart as it should, or if it's going in the opposite direction and pulling in the legs, causing swelling. So we have to put the measurements of the diameter of the vessels and how much reflux there is, if there's no reflux or how many seconds there is of reflux. And we draw the varicose veins on the paperwork. So these are the macros that we use to copy and paste when we are writing up exams. So I copy and paste this into the patient's, the patient's report. 
when I'm finished with the exam to describe exactly what I saw during the exam. So this makes it a little bit easier. In the doctor's office, appointments are constantly changing. So that's why I crossed a couple exams out. And those are the add-ons that we have so far underneath that line. Again, I'm cleaning up a room after an exam. It's important to try to help out and clean even though the nurses help us out with cleaning the rooms at times. I try my best to participate in cleaning up everything. So now it's lunch time, my favorite part of the day. Check out this fancy desk you can use as a standing or sitting desk. Now for lunch, I usually either go to my car or find somewhere quiet where I can be by myself because I need to recharge because I'm talking to people around patients all day and I like to be by myself and yes the, the light is off because I like it dark if I can. I'm eating some mango and I have sensitive teeth now apparently so that was why I made that face and I made some birria tacos over the weekend so I hear some leftover meat and rice just random leftovers I put together and <laughs> I don't know why I'm making that face I make a lot of funny faces apparently and my tacos did not turn out well I needed more seasoning so that's probably again why I'm making that face I like a lot of flavor so lunchtime 30 minutes I just like to recharge so I can get back and be around humans again. So another crossed out. Somebody else rescheduled. But another add-on that we have. Here I'm probably writing up exams. That is a lot of what we have to do. After each exam we have to interpret what we see. And in some cases it is kind of tricky. A lot of times... Certain exams are easy to write up, like a carotid exam can be, most times, easy to write up, a lower extremity DVT study, but other exams like the reflux studies and mesenteric studies can be difficult to write up. Now, when writing up exams in vascular, you have to really be careful about what you're saying because a lot of times, although vascular surgeons read these exams, they keep a lot of our wording. So... This is a lot different from general ultrasound, where the radiologist might write something completely different. But with vascular, they are keeping a lot of the same exact things that we are saying. So we have to make sure we're not making mistakes. So this is what a bypass graph example of what you could write. If the bypass appears normal, you can just copy and paste that into the report. Now, this is what I mean by bi bypass graft if you're not familiar with it. An artery will be occluded or completely blocked. No blood flow is able to pass. A surgeon creates a bypass, a detour for the blood to get to where it needs to go to reach the bottom of the foot. When writing up exams, whenever I'm struggling to describe pathology that I'm seeing, I look up my pathology criteria sheet and that helps me to categorize certain stenoses and accurately describe my report. So this is the end of my day guys. I'm running out the door and guess what? I stayed till 4 30. I completely of forgot I was supposed to leave at four o'clock and I like leaving at four. I feel like I can do more stuff and I have more me time. So that stinks. But now I have to get all the snow off my car. It was snowing this afternoon. Thankfully, even though today was kind of busy, I don't feel drained. Even though I forgot my vitamin D today, I definitely try to consider work just to be part of my day, not my whole day. So I like to do things after work that make me feel good, make me feel like I have a life. I'll read, for example, tonight I am editing this video and I'll sometimes watch TV, I'll do something that interests me, or just whatever I can do to wind down so I can be ready to get a solid 8 to 9 hours of sleep. I need my sleep! 
I hope that this video was informative for you and let me know is there anything that you did not know before watching this video that you did learn from watching. I saw that you guys really liked the last day in the life video but I wanted to make this one a little bit different hopefully better and more informative so definitely check out my channel see if there are any other videos that interest you i have information on a lot of topics and i'll see you in the next video